Okay, we are now recording. So I'm gonna ask all the panelists to please turn on their screens and I'm gonna do a quick introduction of all the panelists or all the session presenters. Um, and I will also turn on the captions. Thanks for the reminder. There we go. The live transcript captioning should be turned on. Yes, is that working? Okay, great. So uh, I'm gonna do the introductions for today. I'm So my name is Amber Leahy and I will be moderating today's session. Thank you all for joining us at session four, day one of the Global Virtual ISS Conference 2021. We have three presentations during this session. Our first presentation is being given by Elizabeth Blackwood, the Digital Curation and Scholarship Librarian at California State University, Channel Islands, where she specializes in research data management, scholarly communications, and digital curation. Prior to her work in academic libraries, she served as a digital asset manager for museums and cultural institutions in Washington, D.C. area, and her biggest passion in libraries is ensuring that best practices and standards are accessible and equitable for all users. Our second presentation will be given by three presenters. Karen Majewitz, the Geospatial Project Manager and Metadata Coordinator for the Big Ten Academic Alliance Geospatial Data Project. Uh, she's based at the John R. Bosher Map Library at the University of Minnesota. Minnesota. And um, she is joined by Melinda Kernick, Spatial Data Analyst and Curator, University of Minnesota and Jamie Martindale, Map and Geospatial Data Librarian in the Department of Geography at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And our last presentation will be given by AJ Millian, a research investigator at the Inter University Consortium for Political and Social Research, ICPSR, um, at the University of Michigan, where he manages the National Archive for Criminal Justice Data. His research examines how and why public sector organizations like libraries, government agencies, and nonprofits use information technology. And in 2017, AJ earned his PhD from the University of Missouri and his dissertation tested the relationship between modes of bureaucratic organization and innovation in US State Department of Transportation websites. Just a heads up to all the attendees, um, please, use the we're going to be doing the q a portion at the end after all the presentations but you're more than welcome to use the zoom q a and the zoom chat at any time and um, we will just answer those and get to them at the end um, if we don't get to your question we will post it in the hoova platform for follow-up after the session has ended if you have any questions or technical issues you can go to the hoova platform in the tech support channel and ask and get in touch with someone there so first up, we have Elizabeth. Are you ready to share your sl slides, Elizabeth? Okay, take it away. Awesome, let me go ahead and get that up. All right, I'm gonna look at Amber and see if she nods at me that she can see it. <laughs> awesome, so thanks guys so much for being here today. Um, while the majority of the paper that I submitted for this competition um, was around a research data management workshop that I regularly do at my institution, the thing I'm really going to talk to you guys about today is more about strategies that I use to make research data management for undergrads more equitable because my institution and I imagine lots of other institutions here present really fall outside the R1 designation. And I think it, that presents a variety of different challenges when you're working um, with training undergrads. So. Um, just to start things off before I get going, um, I want to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the unceded traditional territory and homeland of the Barbarano Venturano Band of the Chumash people, past and present. All right, so I'll tell you a little bit about my institution, which I think will help understand help you understand kind of where I'm coming from with this. Um, I'm a librarian at California State University Channel Islands, which is the newest um, CSU campus of the 23 campuses in our system. And throughout the rest of the presentation, I'm going to be abbreviating, abbreviating it as CI. Um, it's kind of a mouthful. And although it's probably pretty different of an institution from a lot of those that are represented here, um, it's similar to a lot of institutions in the US. Um, so ones that fall outside of that research one or R1, R2 even designation. 
So my campus is designated as a Hispanic serving institution or HSI, and we receive federal funding toward that goal. Um, and we serve a population of students that are 60% first generation. So they are the first in their families to attend college and 55% come from underrepresented or minoritized communities. So despite the fact that we are a poorly funded regional public university that places more emphasis on teaching, um, there is a lot of research that's happening here. Millions of dollars of grant funding flow into this campus every year for faculty projects that are primarily centered on our county and the populations that this university serves. So it's diverse, a diverse institution serving research that benefits a diverse community. Um, but we're not a doctoral granting institution, so the majority of the research support happens through undergrad labor. So there was clearly a need on our campus for research data man management training for undergrads, not only for their personal benefit for those of them that were going to go to graduate school or interest, interested in that type of thing, but also for the support of our faculty on campus. So the major question that occurred to me while I was working on this project was, how do we teach research data management equitably without sacrificing any of the best practice? We're probably all familiar in this session on infrastructure that infrastructure is required um, for good data management practices. Um, but we probably also recognize that such infrastructure is expensive and it's not guaranteed for all institutions. So I'm gonna speak really briefly about the workshop itself. And if you want, there's a link in my slides and I can put a link in the chat to the actual documentation for the workshop. Um, but I'm gonna spend more of my time discussing some of the pain points that I hit when I was developing a more inclusive version of this workshop. So my one short slide on the actual workshop, um, it was 60 minutes long and cost-free. It included a data management plan. So using the DMP tool as my guide. Um, and it was actually integrated as an assignment in the course. The course was a semester long pre capstone prep, like capstone preparation project. So all the students who are in the course were actually participating in group research projects that would ultimately become their thesis. So they had tangible data that they were already working with. And you can see the outline here on the right. Um, it also fostered really great faculty partnership which I'm sure could be a whole another presentation, but I'm not gonna delve too deeply into that. Um, but some of the biggest things to know about doing this workshop, um, the data management plan structured the entire workshop. So anything that I talked about, I tried to leverage the data management plan for. Um, another thing to know about the students that I was working with, about 60 students across two sections, there were really serious equity issues that needed to be dealt with early on. The other librarians in my program were like, we don't do research data management for this group of people because they don't have computers. They don't have access to stable internet. They don't have a lot of the things that we might take for granted if we were doing um, this type of work at an R1 institution. So probably about half of the students in the course that I worked with didn't have their own computers and either managed that through library computer access or phones or tablets, all kinds of different things. So the, those were kind of the the places that I was coming from when I started out um, kind of figuring out what these pain points were going to be. So let's start off. The first equity issue pain point was storage. Um, while storage is getting cheaper and cheaper, we all probably recognize that it's still a cost that I couldn't ask students to take on. Um, lots of universities actually provide server space for student projects, but this is not true at my institution. So there was no dedicated space for that to for them to actually store and back up their projects to kind of work around that. Um, the big thing is to understand where they're where they are going to be using their storage and primarily that was free or university provided Google Drive accounts, Dropbox accounts, free cheap cloud storage, or if there was a member of the group who had their own computer somewhere on their hard drive. So the workaround here was really to discuss that and bring it up, bring it into the space, actually address it, rather than just brushing over you need two backups, you need three backups, you have to actually walk the students through this and have them map out in their data management plan where whose responsibility it is, where it's going to go, and how they're going to manage um, uh, version control on that. The next major equity issue was file naming. So like I just mentioned, that freely available and cheap storage platforms, they don't really make it easy to rename files. Um, just for some context, a lot of these students were working on projects that involved a lot of file manipulation and analysis based off the file name. So I spent a lot of time working on that, talking about this topic specifically in conversation with the faculty members. Um, 
And if you've ever had to re rename a large batch of files in Google Drive or using one of their plugins, you probably know what I'm talking about here um, in terms of the challenges that that, that has. Um, so the workaround here was really to leverage that data management plan again. And I asked them to think critically about their workflows, especially for data collection, and to actually identify the points when a file is generated and when it's ingested into a storage location and ask them to plan accordingly. So there's not exactly a right or wrong answer other than, you know, helping students locate manuals for the like physical hardware that they're using to collect data and making sure that the machine that they're using outputs the correct thing before it is ingested into uh, some type of storage location. Lastly, probably the most challenging, um, the equity issue is time. Um, we all know that data management can be very time consuming and really painstaking at its worst. So just imagine trying to do that work without your own computer or without any automation tools to automatically back things up, um, the things that a lot of us might be accustomed to. So many of the students in this workshop, like I mentioned, relied on library computers as the primary way to get their work done. And on top of that, the library is in a physical place, at least outside of the pandemic, um, in a physical place. And all these students are mostly commuters. So they have time associated with coming to campus from their job or from taking care of their kids or you know, their fam other family responsibilities, all kinds of things that are not on a traditional undergraduate student that we might think of when we think of a student who would be in our classes. So while there's, again, not an awesome workaround for this, it was super important to be realistic with the students about it so that we can plan together and be a resource to them during that planning process. Rather than brushing over topics like file transfers and dat moving data and those the time kind of concern with that, it was really important to ask students to think about where these, thing, where these moments were going to occur at what point of their workflow and account for those slowdowns and to document it in their data management plan. So finally, the big takeaways, um, even if you are at an R1, it's a good idea to take a deep look at any type of RDM work that you're doing with undergrads. We really wanna ensure that undergrads from underrepresented backgrounds feel like careers in research are possible for them. So making sure that they have all of the means and to think through these problems with the resources that they do have was super important for the students that I worked with. I also included some discussion on actual careers in data management. So the folks who are really interested in it could actually explore like what it looks like to be a data curator or to be a librarian who works with research data management because most had not heard of that as a field. Um, and then even more important, well, maybe not more important, but equally important is there's clearly a need for more attention to this in our, in our literature. So when I did a literature review for this project, um, almost everything I saw was completely silent about equity, diversity, and inclusion. So I think it's really something, it says something about the state of the literature. And I think a lot of us are getting really good at doing this work at our major, at major institutions at very high levels. And I think there is time for dedicating some of, some of that, that excellence that we've accomplished and, and thinking about who we're leaving out of this type of work. So that is all. I'm going to leave my email up really quickly. So you, if you have thoughts or you want to collaborate on something or you do this at your own institution, have other ideas, I'd love to hear about it. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Elizabeth. So something for us all to keep in mind, especially as we transition over to the talks uh, that are specifically looking more closely at infrastructure. So Karen, Melinda, Jamie, are you guys ready to get started? Okay, take it away. All right, can you see my screen? Great. All right, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this comparison of data cultures in local government. In the United States, county and municipal governments are primary creators of foundational geospatial data, including layers like parcels, address points, and road center lines. This data is often aggregated to create state and national frameworks, such as state parcel fabric and next generation 911 emergency layers. Despite the importance of these foundational layers, policies about whether this data is free and open to the public varies drastically from place to place. Some regions may offer hundreds of open data layers, while their neighbors may have none, preferring to restrict the data due to privacy or economic concerns. Today, we are going to talk about two neighboring Midwestern states, Minnesota and Wisconsin. 
Both states have a long history of promoting GIS technology. They have well supported geodata platforms that centralize access to resources from state, county, and city agencies. Their models diverge, though, when it comes to efforts around aggregating and archiving local geodata, with Wisconsin mandating that its counties make data layers free and open to the public, while Minnesota uses a more voluntary approach. Um, so just a quick definition, when we are talking about open geodata in this presentation, we mean something with an open license or status that is free and that is downloadable. So not just a layer that you would interact with in an online application, but something you could download. Um, and we recognize that there is ongoing discussion about what is the most important characteristic for open data or open geodata to have. Um, and we discuss them in more detail in our longer article. Um, and also we are primarily going to be focusing on the availability of parcel data. So our central question is, how have differences in legislation, funding, and workflows between the two states affected the availability of open geodata? And what lessons can we learn from their different approaches? Um, so we are going to start with a quick overview of our two case studies and then have a conversation about points of departure. So our first case study is going to be the state of Minnesota. Uh, Minnesota was an early hotbed for GIS development and coordinated data management endeavors. Uh, in fact, one of the very first geographic information systems in the world began in 1967 at the University of Minnesota. The Minnesota Land Management Information Systems mission at that time was to inform land use decisions by providing a framework of 19 statewide geospatial data layers. By the 1990s, GIS was being used more widely and several Minnesota agencies hosted their own open data portals. This meant that students and researchers had free and straightforward access points to regional data layers. Uh, this was much earlier than most other states in the United States. Uh, by 2015, the state's various geoportals merged into a single official state platform known as the Minnesota Geospatial Commons. Uh, today, this site contains over 900 resources that have been contributed uh, by 45 different organizations. So all of these statewide open data efforts over the years, however, have not uniformly trickled down to the local level. So although the state's uh, Geospatial Advisory Council champions open data as their number one priority, there's no mandate for counties or cities to make any of their geodata free and open. Uh, nonetheless, many local governments have joined the open data movement in the past few years, and they voluntarily provide key geodata laters, uh, such as parcels and road center lines, uh, to the public for free. Uh, the Borchard Map Library at the University of Minnesota has spearheaded several projects that contribute to Minnesota's open data landscape as well, uh, including the Minnesota Historical Aerial Photographs Online website and the Big Ten Academic Alliance GeoPortal. Uh, more recently, several staff members from the library are leading a state-sponsored work group to develop a legislative initiative to implement a statewide archive for all public geodata. And our second case study is the state of Wisconsin. Wisconsin also has a long history of prioritizing the development and modernization of land records, including legislation that created the Wisconsin Land Information Program in 1985. In the early days, local geospatial data wasn't always easy to acquire. Online access wasn't common until more recently, and previous licensing restrictions made access challenging, including for academic users and undergraduates in particular. As a way to facilitate access to this valuable data, the Robinson Map Library formed relationships with staff in county land information offices to acquire their data for academic use. The library launched an online geo portal in 2014 to make access to the growing repository of data even easier. 
Over the years, library staff began to track changes and trends in data access across the state, including the slow but steady elimination of licensing and other fee-based restrictions. And while some state and local agencies eventually began to offer online access to their data, it is worth noting that even in 2014, there was no formal statewide clearinghouse or geo portal for broad access to all Wisconsin geospatial data. We see a shift occur with the passage of Act 20, which includes legislation and funding for a statewide parcel initiative to create a free and open statewide digital parcel map. The Department of Administration led the parcel effort while the map library continued to work with counties to acquire a growing list of additional data layers. In an effort to create a mutually beneficial data collection process, in 2017, DOA expanded its call for data to include the data collected by the map library. This change combined the two annual requests into one and created efficiencies that helped the library get closer to 100% compliance from counties. 2021 marks version seven of our statewide parcel layer, and we have a process in place to annually collect and archive 12 unique data layers for all 72 counties in Wisconsin. It's a mutually beneficial process that helps the library provide access to data for a wide range of users and the DOA meet its goals for the statewide parcel initiative. All right, so what is the outcome of these two states diverging practices? If you look at the number of counties in each state that self-publish some kind of open geodata, the two states are basically on par with one another. About 45% of counties are making some kind of geodata available on their own. The difference becomes more obvious when you start looking at the availability of foundational data layers. In 2015, only 16% of Minnesota counties published parcels as open geodata as compared to every county in Wisconsin. Um, so let's compare a few of the key differences between Minnesota and Wisconsin's approaches. Um, and first we're going to look at legislation. Both states have long-standing statutes that defined government data as open to the public, but subsequent qualifications to that legislation have led to substantial impacts on um, open data landscapes. So Minnesota has a law on the books uh, going back to 1974 that de defines all public data as open. Um, however, in 1990, an amendment was passed that grants cities and counties the right to charge a fee specifically for geodata. And this functions as a kind of a loophole that has effectively prevented local geodata from being findable and accessible across a large part of the state. With the passage of Act 20 and parcels now part of a public statewide layer, the shift toward more open data in Wisconsin is underway. DOA worked with counties to make data created with WLIP funds publicly accessible, referring to Wisconsin open records laws and other supportive case laws in the few instances of pushback. DOA also worked with county boards to change existing local restrictions that went beyond the land information offices. And while not always a smooth process, all 72 counties now publicly share not only parcels, but many other layers as well. Um, the, the allocation of funding around open geodata is another key difference between the two states. So there really is no centralized funding source um, that supports the creation of local geodata in Minnesota. Uh, so a lot of counties continue to charge for access to data as a way to recoup the costs of producing it. In Wisconsin, the land information program is funded in an interesting way. A $15 document recording fee is added to all real estate transactions, with $8 of that retained by the county for land records and GIS work. The remaining $7 funds base budget grants eligible to counties that generate less than $100,000 a year in retained fees. For example, larger, more populated counties have generated upwards of $500 to $600,000 per year through this program. With the available funding, there's high incentive for counties to participate. 
The last difference we're going to talk about involves how local governments participate in their state's central geodata platform and the workflows um, involved in sharing data. Um, any governmental nonprofit or educational organization can use the state supported Minnesota geospatial commons as their open data platform. Uh, so the workflow is a self service model whereby contributors have full control and full responsibility for their resources. Uh, they do need to set up a local node on a file sharing application, uh, write all their own metadata and upload it bundled with their data sets up to the commons. Uh, the Commons requires valid metadata that conforms to the state guidelines. Uh, and this metadata threshold keeps the quality of the data in the Commons very high, but it also has the effect of preventing most counties from participating. Uh, out of the 39 counties that self publish geodata in Minnesota, only 10 of them actively contribute to the Commons. In Wisconsin, each year, the Department of Administration sends a call for data to all 72 counties. The State Cartographer's Office, which is part of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, is contracted to generate the statewide layer. The map library archives the data for long-term preservation, writes discovery metadata, and creates access online through Geodata at Wisconsin. A similar version of this library workflow has been in place in the library since 2005, but it's now much more efficient. DOA's acquisition of the data in an organized and predictable way is a huge help in the library's data access and preservation goals. So finally, in conclusion, through this work, we've learned that legislation, funding, and workflows have a major impact on the ability to successfully archive and provide access to open geospatial data. Legislation can help formalize a process, making expectations clear. Providing dedicated funding is an incentive for participation and can help enhance data production. Designing collaborative workflows that make data creation, sh data creation sharing efficient also make participation less of a burden for data producers. Collaboration between data producers and libraries is a powerful thing. Librarians offer expertise in discovery and access to information. They can clear up misconceptions about metadata and break down the perceived barriers to creating it. Librarians also see the value in archiving and, and providing access to temporally significant data to allow for historical research and visualization through time. Wisconsin and Minnesota continue to learn from each other, including best practices for thoughtful and inclusive ways to approach possible legislation, models for funding, and workflow designs. As progress is made on the open geospatial data landscape, the dialogue in each state continues and the best path forward becomes clearer. And with that, thank you so much for listening today and we're happy to take all of your questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Karen, Melinda, and Jamie. If you have any questions for either the first presentation, presenter Elizabeth and the, the group here, please put them in the Q&A. We're doing really well for time. Uh, so AJ, do you wanna get set up? And I'll just mention that I really enjoyed learning about the creative ways to fund open geospatial data, especially the example where they charge real estate fees to then feed back into statewide infrastructure. Amazing, very creative. Take it away, AJ. Oh, we can't hear you. Do you are you muted, AJ? I am not now. Great. So thanks for that check. Uh, and I was gonna say, yeah, I really enjoyed the last presentation too. It was really, really interesting. So I, I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about scholarly communication and ARL libraries investment and in research data infrastructure in the United States. And this presentation has to do with uh, two academic articles I co-wrote with Heather Muley San Sandy and Cynthia Hudson Vital, um, who was at Penn State University. And both of these have to do with how uh, ARL libraries restructured and formalized to create new positions to support academic research relating to scholarly communication and research data management. Um, both of these articles are available online if you ever want to read them um, and know a little bit more about my presentation. 
you can you can read these two articles they have all the things that i'm not going to really be able to cover today i'm going to just try and give you a high level overview of uh what we found in our work so with that said, I'm just going to start out with a little bit of general background information and say that the US federal government awards over half of all research dollars to university affiliated researchers, such as those working at, say, the University of Wisconsin or the University of Minnesota. Um, many of these researchers work for Association of Research Library members, and increasingly major research libraries such as these support researchers throughout all stages of the research life cycle. So from the beginning of the research life cycle to the closing out of it, um, ARL librarians often support that. And using data and findings from the two peer reviewed studies I mentioned earlier in my presentation, what I'm going to do is describe how librarians in North America designed research support positions to help academics connect this process to ARL libraries, increased investment in research data infrastructure. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about the design process um, kind of as I continue on. To give you a little bit of uh, background about how I'm going to present things today, I'm going to split things into four parts before concluding. And part one has to do with the hiring of scholarly communications librarians. So. Each year, uh, ARL has a survey, and once per year, 125 libraries submit data for employees for all of their positions. Local survey coordinators choose a job code to match each position, and this data is later cleaned and normalized and then aggregated. And um, working with Cynthia Hudson, uh, we examined positions that were coded as scholarly communications librarians or digital curation librarians. Uh, and we chose these positions because they related to the bulk of work relating to scholarly communications, either digital curation, research data management, and open access and publishing. Um, also keep in mind scholarly communication is more general than research data management, but what we were trying to do here is we're trying to get a sense of the growth of scholarly communications positions in general, and this is, this is how we began the study, we're just kind of interested in this data. So, and what we found when we got this data is that between 2012 and 2017, positions with job titles like scholarly communication and digital curation um, increased annually, and the increase slowed over time. There was kind of an S curve to where there was a rapid increase and then it leveled out. And the two combined categories as of 2017 totaled about 230 individuals, which was not, it was much lower at the beginning of the cycle with the data we looked at. And when you break out these two categories, um, what you find is that there's been an increased focus on things like open access, supporting all different parts of the scholarly communications process, not just conducting research, but communicating it, providing it in open access repositories, providing access to research data, but also curating it, managing access to it, and so on. And what we can take away from this is that ARL libraries hire the large number of staff or reclassified them during this time period to carry out new tasks that previously weren't done on that scale. And here's a chart of what we found. Um, it basically shows that in 2012, 2013, uh, there was about 100 digital curation librarian positions and there weren't any scholarly communication positions tracked, but by 2016, 2017, you had seen quite a bit of growth as more attention began to be paid to these two interrelated areas. So using that kind of as a background, I'm gonna to move to part two that talks to the birth of a professional subfield. Um, what we did is kind of informed by this growth in the number of these two positions, we got interested in this process of how they became formalized or what they actually looked like in the work that was actually carried out. And we found that professional competencies documents scattered across the time period we examined basically showed that librarians designed a new professional subfield during this period with digital curation and research data management in mind. Um, this aligned with an increase in hiring and we established that there was a, a process, not necessarily centralized, but not necessarily decentralized either, where the profession um, basically started agreeing about core competencies and skills that were needed. And what we did is we um, identified relevant guidelines for these sorts of positions. We compiled competencies and skills documents and developed the coding categories. And then we coded competencies to match with these categories. 
And there were three documents. There was the Librarian's Competencies Profiles for Research Data Management, a matrix of digital curation knowledge and competencies and preparing the workforce for digital curation. So ba basically what we did is over time, we looked at the skills in these documents and traced how much they agreed with one another over time and tried to see if there was any agreement. Now to ensure that the comparison across these documents were reliable, we used high level descriptions and text um, from these documents. And so like as a category example, the category for research workflows included skills such as the ability of a curator to understand research practices, workflows, and or their ability to understand disciplinary norms and standards. And, and the main takeaway here, aside from what I mentioned earlier, like with the growth in these positions, is we actually saw these standard documents become more uniform. So the first one didn't agree as much with the second two. And by the time you got to the second and third one, there was much, much more agreement about what core skills and competencies were required of these positions. And you can actually see this here. Um, we had core competencies, emerging competencies, auxiliary ones, and then others. And you'll see that there were certain areas that there was agreement across the board through all the documents. There were others that were emerging. And then there were other auxiliary areas that there wasn't as much agreement. Okay, so uh, what I've done is I've showed that there was the hiring of these positions and that these skills became a little more formalized. What I am going to do now is I'm going to argue that when ARL libraries hired these positions, they committed and invested in research data infrastructure. And I define this in a socio-technical sense, which basically means um, infrastructure is both social and practice-based or technical. It involves systems. Um, so Faneuil and Conway find that academic library and supporting research data management interviewed in 2013 and 12 and concluded that there's still opportunities to more efficiently and actively support the research data lifecycle. But by the end of this period, we found that the field was actually coalescing together and that there's a lot of um, codification, generally speaking, within the field. But we're gonna go a little farther than that, just than the competencies. Um, there's this re uh, academic researcher out there, he wrote a really well-known book called The Diffusion of Innovations, and he looked at the spread of innovative ideas through social systems, and he says there are four factors that determine if one will spread, and that's the innovation itself or the idea, communication time, and the social system. And so kind of taking all this together, what we found is that scholarly communication positions appear to have diffused through the academic library community through the disciplinary education. Um, for example, there was a, a scholarly communications roadshow that shared uh, these different skills and information about this throughout the profession, throughout the time period we examined. And we can assume that at each point in this period we looked at, individual libraries learned how to support scholars in this changing environment and faced a decision of whether they wanted to hire new people or quote unquote restructure. So then ARL libraries then created new positions, which means internal decision makers made a decision to restructure. And within the libraries, the data we have suggests that these restructurings were informed by or similar to those competencies documents. So it's, it, it's kind of a complicated way of describing a relatively simple process, but we actually saw evidence that academic libraries were adjusting to the needs of researchers with research data management at the core and providing more and more support directly to scholars, which is really, really interesting. And to do this, they necess by uh, necessity had to invest in infrastructure to do it. So something that's not clear here though, is what's the best way to ensure the work these professionals do is used and valued. And Rogers, the guy who I mentioned to earlier refers to this process as, as uh, clarifying and creating routines, which means ensuring that the people who use these services understand their value and that they're managed effectively. All right, so to wrap up, um, given our findings and Roger's theory, which I really didn't go into, but there's a lot more in the paper, how can librarians best show their ability to support researchers? Um, Rogers talks about the process by which organizations choose to adopt or projecting the innovation. And this is not a linear process, even though the one that I've described. So the kind of takeaway here is that the long-term sustainability of these positions is something that isn't set. So a lot, 
going on here in the future will depend on how well these positions are justified to users. Um, if the organizations of which they're a part understand their value and the documents, um, the competencies documents that I described earlier match up to actual on the ground skills and needs. So uh, given the codification of the field that I'm talking about, it appears there's this constant need for consistent strong messages to be sent to users. And our work really didn't look at smaller institutions that lack the infrastructure to accommodate researchers. We just looked at very large ARL libraries. So there's um, some more research that could be done in that area. So I'm gonna kind of conclude here and just say that um, more work needs to be done evaluating the proven value of these positions. I think they do really great work, um, but this is something that's instrumental to their continued success and their continued funding. Uh, the competencies documents we evaluated, me and my co-authors, aligned with different stages of the research data life cycle, further establishing that they're becoming more and more formal, but we don't know about sustainability in the long term, and our findings, findings were especially relevant and noteworthy in relation to research data management, not just scholarly communication, because they show academic libraries are investing and inserting themselves into the research data life cycle in, in entirely new ways. Um, that's all I have, so I can just go and wrap up, and I'd be interested in hearing any questions you have. Thank you, AJ. Thank you to all the pres presenters. If you have questions, please feel free to put them in the in the Q and A in the Zoom Q and A box. Uh, so we do have a question. I believe this one is for the GIS group. So um, there's a, a question from Chris. Uh, have you done a survey of other state laws regarding open data and open GIS data? Uh, I can address that. So Chris, that's a really good question. And when we initially um, formulated the idea for this uh, paper, that was uh, what we were hoping to do. Um, and I, I'll put a link in the chat to a place where there actually is some pretty good um, if somebody did want to look more into that, I would recommend that website at NISGIC, <laughs> National States uh, Geographic Information Council, is having some good information about that. Um, we decided for uh, our purposes that it we wanted to just narrow down, scale down the paper to just focusing on our two states. Um, there is a lot of shared history and culture between uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin, and a lot of people that work in nonprofit or commercial industries work in both states. Um, and we really wanted to bring attention to what we think of as the Wisconsin success story, because a lot of people in Minnesota weren't really aware of it. They only knew that there was a lot more open data in Wisconsin than there was in Minnesota, and they didn't understand why. Why? So uh, that's a good question. Um, maybe that'll be our uh, our our part two. <laughs> so while you all, if you could, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q and A. Um, while you all do that, I'm going to ask a question of of the group. So it's interesting that you all sort of identified more of the social or the impacts of the social political economic systems on the use and development of infrastructure for data access and research data. Um, I just wanted to ask you all, and, and do you, given this understanding of infrastructure, which AJ did outline for us, so thank you for that, um, how, can, how can we in libraries sort of reduce any of that bias or issues around representativeness that Elizabeth talked about in the process of developing and, and supporting use of infrastructure for data. Does anyone want to go first? I'll take one question about it. I think or one thought just af after listening to AJ's um, presentation about how you know, he made the call for more study of more libraries. And I think that's where the representation is gonna come is there obviously like I have a digital curation position at, um, at a library that was not, probably would not have fallen into that research set, that, that data from the ARL survey. So I think it would be important to see how much is being done at these smaller universities there, what, what types of things are being done there. Um, 
and do a study of that material. So more research done in that area for, the, for those libraries that fall out of that category. Great idea. Um, anyone else want to give a go at that, at how to reduce or think about these issues at, as developers or um, hosts or uh, stewards of, of data infrastructure? I can add a few thoughts. I don't have any perfect solutions or anything, but I think maybe a good place to start is just to recognize that often infrastructure is designed and when you had, and it doesn't necessarily have to be part of a formal planning process, it can be emergent or it can be designed over time. So maybe a way to handle that is just to kind of acknowledge that infrastructure usually serves people like and serves certain purposes. And if you wanna have an expansive view of it, like you should ask who it serves and how it, what it serves. So like, if you're talking about like marginalized communities, you know, like or accessibility or things along those lines, just keeping that in the forefront of your mind kind of can make sure that it's actually being built out to help people and serve them. I don't think that always happens because sometimes infrastructure just blends into the background and we just kind of take it as a given. Or you, you teach people how to use it in a certain way and that just gets repeated over time. Thank you for those thoughts. Any other thoughts before we move on to, it looks like we do have some questions now in the Q&A. Okay, um, next question from Katie. Question from Melinda. You mentioned that undergrad labor is necessary for research at your institution. With the equity issues, is there any hope looking forward that the institution will help remedy the issues to better support undergraduate workers who all help us in the libraries? We rely on them. Do you want to take that, Melinda? Yeah, so I'm thinking this might have been meant for Elizabeth, probably. So, yes, <laughs> yeah. I'm just reading it through one more time. Yep. It's a great question. Um, I don't know exactly what that remedy might look like, aside from you know every student having access to a machine, but. I, I don't know if that's something happening anytime now, especially with the, the state that our, our budget is. After um, COVID, we saw a huge influx of community college students. So I think the community colleges are gonna get a ton, a ton more of our budget share that we get with the state. So I think that's gonna kind of shift where our ability is to, um, to I guess, provide that type of infrastructure. Another interesting thing is our, a lot of our, library funds at my institution and the, that infrastructure for classrooms, for those types of things comes from student fees. So our students actually vote and on a, their own panel and decide where that money goes. So it's kind of a catch 22 for us that I don't get them till their fourth year students to know that this is important. And, you know, they're like, actually, I want my, my gym membership to be better kind of situation. We're, we're competing for that same pool of funds. So it's, it's interesting. I don't know. Um, if it's well communicated, student research is a is a popular topic for folks on their RTP, but I don't know if it's as popular uh, as it would be for for communicating it to our upper level administration. So I'm hopeful for it, but I'm trying hard to kind of work within what I've got now, not assume that I'm going to get any more machinery or resources in that that regard. Thanks. AJ, do you want to go ahead? Uh, Wendy's asking um, in your definitions of, of these SCALCOM and RDM, we've been looking for data library and stream in library schools for decades now from reading your paper. It doesn't sound like it will be happening anytime soon. Is that right? You go ahead. So I think a lot of that depends on library schools and like the different models that they have. Um, if they're just chasing after revenue with a smaller number of them, like that might be hard. Um, so I don't know if that'll happen or not. I can say based off what we saw, the increase in the number of people that are classified in this way and the competencies from a curriculum perspective, it's definitely possible to provide that and to have the classes. I just don't know. I, I don't know about the full term, full teaching stream. I'd say it's closer now than it was five or 10 years ago. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure if we're quite there yet. So it's like moving the needle, but um, I wouldn't say anytime soon, but I, I also don't have any data about that at this point. So, so it's like kind of a mixed bag. There are definitely 
I think has been an increase in demand. It just depends on if there's enough demand for it. And that's something we didn't look at. Yes, always interesting to think about intersections between um, those, kind, those kinds of data services positions and these new data positions. Absolutely. Uh, so I'm just double checking. So I think we answered Katie's, Wendy's. Uh, there's some chat going on, but I think it's being sent to the panelists, but lots of support for thinking about smaller schools and how to engage with more diverse examples of institutions on this. And it's Paula's mentioning that session three on Thursday is related to this question, so that's great. And then moving on to Rosa's question for Elizabeth. Uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned the lack of literature about equity, diversity, inclusion. Will you be sharing your lit review in a publication? That's the plan. Nothing in the works just yet, but that's, that is an ultimate goal. <laughs> so thanks. But I'm happy to email, email it out to anyone who's interested in, in advance if you're fighting at the bit. You want, want something a little earlier. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Any other questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A chat. Um, I, I have a question for AJ. You know, thinking about how you've tracked the increase in these positions and you did make the connection to funding, did you also notice that there was an increase in funding to those institutions that did have those positions or if there's some broader uh, investment being made by funders in this area that, that you could connect to, to your research? Yeah, so interestingly enough, um, the uptick kind of coincided with federal mandates for research data sharing. So there was that piece there too. Um, there was kind of it coincided kind of with an increased amount of attention paid to open science and study replication um, in terms of funding these were all large universities. Um, so they, I would argue they had deep pockets to begin with anyway. And if they didn't have the money to create a new position, they could reclassify existing bulls into these positions. Um, so they, I, I can't really speak to whether there was money dedicated specifically to them, but I can't say they had deep enough pockets to where if they wanted to make it happen, they easily could have. And there was definitely enough attention paid to it in the broader professional community to kind of make them feel like there was a need to go in this direction, which the moment you have that, there's going to be, for lack of a better term, it's a bit of an arms race. Because, um, you know, you might have Michigan going, well, Wisconsin's got this, why don't we have this? Or Wisconsin might do the same with Minnesota and vice versa. So I'd say a lot of it was just the, the climate. There was an increase in the amount of data. There was the opportunity to kind of, you know, you know, publish all the stuff in institutional repositories and there were mandates to provide access to some of this as well. And all of this just kind of came together around the same time. So it kind of created the right climate, I guess. Um, and we didn't survey them to say, well, why did you create these positions? But we can definitely read the tea leaves and say all of these things definitely kind of factored to get together to make it happen. Great, thank you for that. Um, are there any other thoughts to add or I'm gonna move on. So it looks like Katie was trying to ask uh, Melinda a question. Um, in your research on, on Wisconsin and Minnesota, did either state advisories council actively encourage university and or student membership as part of their collaboration for data management? Yeah, so I, I mean, I would say definitely, and Jamie can speak to this more, in the case of Wisconsin, the library was very much central to kind of the role of pulling together data. I'd say in Minnesota, there's been more of a push from like the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources and, and sort of uh, just like a, a more state centered um, approach. And so while definitely the university has been a part of that work, um, it maybe hasn't been quite as, as central. Um. Yeah, and I could just mention in Wisconsin, um, you know, it really was sort of more of an organic kind of coming together of two sort of parallel efforts. The map library um, had been collecting data sort of out of necessity for academic use because it was difficult to find um, starting in 2005. And 
you know, the statewide parcel layer work starting with the biennial budget in 2013 to 2015, sort of looking at one individual layer, um, this partnership sort of between the Department of Administration and the universities sort of naturally came together for the sake of efficiencies. So we weren't, you know, separately asking counties um, two times per year for different types of geospatial data. Um, it was just more efficient um, to send one request. I, I'll also mention this isn't like a formal contract or partnership. We don't get funding or, or we're not paid you know, by DOA for, for this work that we do. We saw it as a way for DOA to take on the labor of acquiring the data for 72 counties, which was the most difficult part of getting information into our repository and into our archive environment. Um, so it saves us a ton of time to have them take on that portion of the work. And then we do what we've always done is create that discovery metadata, you know, building off of what data producers are sending us with their content um, and making it available. And initially it went through several iterations. Initially, you know, the focus was academic users. The, the GeoPortal was locked down to only academic users initially. Um, and then as things started to kind of open up and restrictions went away, we just sort of gradually um, followed that model. And so now it's, you know, a completely open and publicly accessible, accessible data collection. But we also don't have an advisory council in our state. It, there isn't like a, an umbrella group of people with multiple representation from different areas. It's literally the Department of Administration through the land information program kind of running this um, statewide parcel initiative. Great, thank you for clarifying and, and answer, helping to answer that question. Uh, Joyce is asking, we have four minutes left. Joyce is asking for AJ, I may have missed this, but did you find more universities creating new positions or redefining existing positions to meet this new need? Just wondering if there's a trend to either option or a balance between the two. So we actually couldn't tell from the existing data because we used just the raw aggregate numbers of positions classified in the two different categories. So we can't say for sure. However, given the increase over time, I would say at least some of them had to be new. Um, and given the kind of, I don't know, I guess uh, what was I referring to it as kind of the uh, formalization of the skills and how there was kind of this increased consensus over time, I would say a good chunk of them probably were new. Um, they weren't just people saying, we're going to get rid of this old position and create a new one. Um, so it's definitely a growth area. And it, I wouldn't say it's coming at the expense of any other positions because it's so different from a lot of other stuff that was being done. Um, but we don't know the exact numbers compared to before. We'd have to send out a completely new survey and ask them, is this position new? Like, or did you reclassify existing positions? Wish we had that. <laughs> yes, that would be really interesting to know. Thank you. Um, I think we'll do, looks like we've got from Wendy uh, to Elizabeth, your program sounds really important. Do any of your students get hooked on the data bug? And that seems to be a way into the job market these days. So did you get any success there? I did actually, I had two students who came from that class who went on to master's degrees in information science, focusing on data curation. So I know that they're, at least in my short time of doing this, I've had at least, I'm two for two on my <laughs> uh, flow of, of students through that program. So I think it's, it's working. That's great. Great to hear and share. Um, and then I think one more, AJ, did you look at gov government positions as well or just academic? Just academic positions, and I'd be really interested to see government ones. Um, I started my career in government, um, you know, mostly worked with a lot of GovDocs and things along those lines, but there's definitely been a huge uptake in the amount of data government agencies collect. Um, so, yeah, um, if anybody does that study, like and looks at what government agencies done and the changes there, I'd love to see it. Like, it'd be fascinating. For sure. Okay, well, thanks everyone. I think this was went really well. And thanks again to all of our presenters. Um, I, I don't believe we have any questions. So 
we won't move anything over into the Hoopa platform. And thanks again for participating in the chat and, and, and putting in questions for the presenters. We really appreciate it. Okay, on to the next session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.